Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. I'm Dirk Kelly. Uh, I live here in Perth with my wife. Um, but for about the last 10 years, I've lived in America. So I'm here today to talk about the Green New Deal from the context of the United States, um, the people involved in it there, what it, the policies are so far, and what we can do going forward from there. Um, so firstly, I know we all here recognize this, but climate change is a disaster that is facing all of human life. Um, the IPCC report, which came out in 2018, which is a coalition of scientists from around the world, backed by the United Nations, along with a few other organizations, has stated that climate change represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human life. So the solution, a solution proposed to that has been the Green New Deal, but the question that we really have to ask and that we're going to be asking today is, what is the Green New Deal? And the first thing to understand is that there are many, many Green New Deals. Um, so the Green New Deal overall is a proposal about um, how we take on climate change, how we evolve our society to, to affect change. <laughs> um, so it's essentially a proposal for tackling climate change. Um, and I'm just going to be summarising one proposal um, and then how we can go on from there. Um, that proposal is referred to as the green print for a new deal. Um, it was created by Data for Progress back in 2018. Um, it's been used as a backer for a few different proposals. Um, and I'll just go through the four different aspects of it. So the first aspect is transforming to a low carbon economy. So essentially what that means is changing the way that we get energy in society. So firstly, focusing on clean and renewable energy um, with the proposal being to get to 100% clean and renewable energy by 2035. Now in the past, there's been other Green New Deals that are proposed doing that by 2020, and 2025, and 2030. So um, we'll see that number change depending on which Green New Deal we're looking at, but the facts remain the same. We need to transition away from uh, fossil fuels, from the uh, sources of energy that are creating the greenhouse gases, the greenhouse pollution, um, and we need net zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, the next topic is energy efficiency, so how we utilise that energy that's produced. Right now we have a lot of wastage uh, through our housing, through our transportation, through everything. So utilising energy in a far more efficient manager, manage, man, anyway, in a far more efficient manner. Um, and transportation, so this is a big factor of uh, climate of energy usage, the way that we get around. Uh, obviously we live in a society that really values the use of car and promotes people, one person in one car driving around a lot. Um, so the proposals come out with 100% zero emission tra uh, pedestrian oh, uh, passenger vehicles um, and 100% fossil, uh, fossil free transportation by 2050. So that's transforming to a low carbon economy. Um, clean air and clean water need to be a right. So the two most valuable resources that we rely on as a species and as life on Earth uh, is clean air and clean water. Um, climate change does severely affect that. Greenhouse emissions affect our air um, and pollution is destroying our water. In America, there are big infrastructural problems. So I'm sure some of you have heard about lead pipe issues and just the drinkability of water. Um, I don't have the exact stats on me, but they're looking at like somewhere between 20% at least of cities in America not having drinkable water. Um, that issue also affects the US military itself. Uh, bases in the US don't have clean water. Uh, so it's a real infrastructural problem. So this green print for New Deal, as well as other green New Deal proposals in America, do really have to focus on the infrastructure issues in America. There's a lot of crumbling infrastructure that came out of what was referred to as the New Deal, which I'll actually be getting into a little bit in the, in the, uh, in the near future. Um, restoring the American landscape. So the effects of society on America um, over the last 250, 300 years um, have been devastating. Uh, and if anything is going to be saved, it needs to be saved now. Uh, forests, uh, they're talking about reforesting 40 million acres of land. Um, wetlands, 5 million acres of wetlands. You know, basically these really important air, uh, environmental areas of America need to be not only saved, but then restored from where they're at. Uh, changing farming so that we use more sustainable farming solutions. Uh, a lot of American farming is big agriculture. 
So it's a lot of large farms run by corporations that just do mass farming efforts using a lot of pesticides, using a lot of um, chemicals to try to undo the effects of mass farming. We need to really reapproach the way that we do farming. And I know there are a few permaculture people here in the room. Um, obviously that's a way of looking at it, uh, but how do we transform the way that we produce food and utilize the land that we have left? Uh, and in America, uh, some brownfields and hazardous sites. So a brownfield in America is a nice way of saying a piece of land that's been destroyed by economic activities and is now no longer usable. Um, so there needs to be efforts to clean those up. There's also something in America called a, um, uh, a super uh, a super fun site. So that is a site that is so destroyed, toxic, um, radioactive that it needs federal funding in order to resolve the issues. Uh, there are many of them all across the country. Uh, even in New York City, there are riverways that people live alongside, which are toxic riverways that you cannot go into. Uh, and these, these are right next to where people live. Um, and thirdly, uh, or fourthly rather, urban sustainability and resilience. So as our populations grow, and as opportunities for people outside of cities continue to get demolished, people are moving into cities more and more to live. These cities are generally around water areas, areas that are gonna be affected by climate change through uh, sea level rises, but also through uh, air quality and just livability. So how do we transform urban areas to not just be these food deserts where people and economic activity lives, where everything is imported, and transform them into areas that produce our own energy, produce their own food, and are just more sustainable and more resilient to the effects of climate change. So those are four of the areas that some of the Green New Deals in America focus on. And I just wanna re-emphasize that, that there is no single Green New Deal. However, there are very progressive candidates in America pushing for legislative Green New Deals, and I'd like to talk about that now. So, who is fighting for a Green New Deal in America? Um, the first person I want to talk about is a very new and upcoming uh, political face, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, is a US congressperson as of this year. Um, so previously she was a bartender, which is amazing. Um, and she stepped up and she ran for Bronx in New York and won by a landslide, um, unseating an incumbent democratic position that had just been doing nothing for the community. She's a very community focused and activist, uh, very known in her local area um, and very loud. She's fantastic. She really is pushing for change. Before she even sat as a congressperson, so after she won her election, but before she sat back in 2018, she joined a bunch of activists who did a sit-in at Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi being the head of the Democratic Party in the US, a sit-in in her office to demand for a Green New Deal. Many of those activists were arrested. AOC stood there, engaged with them, created social media content to push that message forward. And that is a really important point of AOC. She's a younger person who is very engaged in technology and understands how to utilize social media to take a message that works locally but can resonate internationally and nationally. Um, so as a congressperson, um, she put forward House Resolution 109, which is um, recognizing the duty of the federal government to create the Green New Deal. So this is an official piece of legislation that now sits in the House in America. She had 67 co-sponsors, um, and this is pushing for the things that I talked about earlier, um, along with more things. So, so what has happened as a result of putting out this proposal is this has created a basis for politicians who are engaged in the topic to take that, explain that, and also provide additional things on top of it. Just in the last two weeks, um, she's been involved in a proposal to uh, create a bunch of uh, housing for low-income people um, that is both affordable but also uh, sustainable, provides food and uses like low um, energy and also a lot of renewable energy. Um, she's also a member of something called the Democratic Socialists of America. Now I myself have been a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. They are a, they're not so much a party, they're a group of people who engage locally to attempt to make the Democratic Party 
more left. So their position is that America is a duality. It's really just a two-party country. Um, there are other parties, but because of the media landscape and because of the culture of the country, they never really talked about. So the DSA works to push the Democratic Party to the left. And AOC has gone now and is a Democratic congressperson pushing the party to the left. Um, she's involved in a group called the Gang of Four, which is her along with three other um, Democratic Congress people, uh, Congress women actually, who are uh, looking to push these policies. Um, the next person I want to talk about is Bernie Sanders, which I'm sure you have all heard about. Bernie Sanders is a long-standing uh, US Senator, uh, politician. He um, was the mayor of Vermont for decades. Um, who has been pushing for fixing the eco disaster that we've been living in for centri uh, de centuries, decades? It's not that old. Um, he is a co-sponsor of Senate Resolution 59. So where we had House Resolution 109, we have Senate Resolution 59. They are the same resolutions. So together they've been they've been pushed forward into the two part seats of government to recognise that the federal government must create a Green New Deal. Bernie Sanders is also running for president in 2020 and he ran for president in 2016. Now, in America and in the American landscape of politics, the president is very important to how what policies are discussed and what is recognised as a doable thing. The president is meant to sort of represent the position of the people. Now, we can always call into question how that is possible. As socialists, we understand that that can't really be a top-down thing. That needs to be a bottom-up perspective of what the people want. And that is Bernie Sanders' campaign. So what he is doing differently to every other Democratic candidate out there is he is running on a campaign of us, not me. I've been at one of his rallies where when you chant Bernie, 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 he's like, no, 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 you, you, you. <laughs> and and that, is, that is what he did in 2016. So in 2016, he lost, right? It was devastating. I was there. It hurt a lot of people. But he only lost within the game that you're being told to pay attention to. What he did as a result of the 2016 campaign was created something called Our Revolution. So Our Revolution was a framework focused on local all the way up politics. How do you get involved in your school board? How do you get involved in your local council, in your House of Representatives, in your Senate? He created the inspiration that took young people off the sidelines, made them get up and vote, firstly, um, <coughs> but also get involved in politics. AOC, along with Rashida Taleb, um, Ilana Omar, other women involved in the uh, Gang of Four I was talking about, came from that Our Revolution, recognised that they can get involved in politics at a much more local level to them and push for the same pieces of change that Bernie Sanders is talking about. And that's a really important thing to recognise with Sanders. Uh, it's very possible he won't win the election. Um, and I'll get into that more in a minute. Uh, but what we need to recognise is what he's trying to do is change the landscape, is to change the culture, to change the change the window of conversation that's allowed. Another very important figure, and this gets into what I was talking about with the two-party system, Dr. Jill Stein is uh, a politician who's in the Green Party of the US, and you would be forgiven for not realising that there was a Green Party in the United States. Um, she ran as presidential candidate in 2012 and 2016, and she actually ran on a Green New Deal. So when we talk about what I showed you earlier, that 2018 um, green print for a New Deal, Jill Stein had a Green New Deal plan decade, a decade before that. Um, and very importantly, Jill Stein's and the, the Green Party in America's position as a Green New Deal is anti-capitalist, it is anti-imperialist. It states that what needs to happen for a just transition is that America needs to stop plundering the rest of the world. America needs to stop focusing on only America. If we're going to have this transition, it needs to be a global transition. America needs to cooperate with everyone and not try to lead that. Um, and you'll see that now in the 2020 debates with the Democratic candidates. Uh, Mariana Wilson, Williamson was a candidate who uh, said that America was gonna be the best at climate change and that when she becomes president, she's gonna call the Prime Minister of New Zealand and tell her that America's gonna do way better climate change than New Zealand. That's the culture, that's the, that's the underlying thesis of the country, is that we're the best and the way to succeed is to have a leader who can help us be the best. And as we all probably around this room understand, 
tackling climate change is not a one person problem, it's not a one country problem, it's a global problem, and we all need to be cooperating, not challenging each other on this. So those are three candidates, and obviously it's a massive landscape, and there are a lot of other candidates out there, but I don't wanna get bogged down in that. What I wanna talk about is what is needed beyond the current efforts. So we have AOC, Bernie Sanders, and Jill Stein, and all these others. What do we need to do beyond it? Well, the first thing to recognize is where this term, the Green New Deal, comes from. The New Deal was a result of the economic collapse in America, the Dust Bowl crisis, uh, the effects of World War I. Um, FDR, the president at the time, created a proposal called the New Deal, which was meant to be a relief for unemployment, a recovery of the economy, and a reform of the financial system. It did all this within the context of a capitalist solution. So what it actually succeeded in doing was protecting capitalism during a time of mass crisis by sort of releasing the tension, you know, giving people work, giving people money, but ensuring that control of the country remained in the hands of the few. So the New Deal squashed socialism. And this here is a little bit of a quote from an article in the Hoover Institute. The Hoover Institute is a very far right capitalist think tank in America that praises how the New Deal squashed socialism. So in their own words, they state how good the, green, the New Deal was for them as capitalists, because it took that anger, it took that energy, that fight against what was going on and pushed it into an economic reform that didn't change capitalism. It just created jobs and created business opportunities for people to take control of more of American infrastructure. Um, so it really did crush the opportunity for a third party revolution, for a socialist revolution in America. So the Green New Deal must be socialist. When analyzing all of these New Deal presentations uh, or solutions or you know, proposals that we get, we need to be looking at it as an anti, from an anti-capitalist perspective. We need to be looking at it from an anti, uh, an anti-growth perspective and from an anti-imperialist perspective. We can't, as I said earlier, have a Green New Deal that is focused on saving capitalism. Capitalism is the cause of the climate catastrophe. Centralized ownership of all wealth, people making decisions based on what will make them money is what has caused the problems that we're living through. And they will come to us with solutions. We will have big oil, we will have, well, Tesla, come along and say that we're gonna create electric cars that are gonna save the future. Well, what happened to Tesla's stock after the coup in Bolivia? Tesla is just green capitalism. It's just green imperialism. It's just another way of doing the same, but with a different piece of branding on top of it to make people feel good about it, while the same problems still occur outside of the American landscape. Sanders needs to take this on, and if Sanders doesn't take this on, the follow-up from Sanders needs to take this on. Um, it needs to be recognized that the Democratic Party, the party that Sanders and AOC is working within, is in no way democratic. The 2016 elections were rigged. The, there are two sets of elections in America. There's the primary election and the presidential election. The primary election, which is what's happening right now for 2020, and it's a very long and arduous and horrible experience to watch, but the two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, have elections for who is going to represent that party. In 2016, the Democratic Party was broke. They turned to Hillary Clinton for funding. Hillary Clinton gave them funding in return for having all control over how the Democratic Party selected the Democratic representative. The WikiLeaks exposure just before the Democratic National Convention really gets into the details of how this worked. Um, the Democratic Party worked with news sources to ensure that Sanders was never talked about. The Democratic Party itself slandered Sanders and you know, attacked him instead of actually providing that opportunity for it. And then during the convention, the election of the, the person comes from the delegates of the different states. So there are a bunch of elections before that that have the decision of which state people want to go with. But then there are people who are allocated as superdelegates. Those people then present not the position of the state, but their position, taking into consideration the position of the state. So superdelegates for states that voted for Sanders voted for Clinton. Now, I understand that my state wanted Sanders, but I don't want Sanders, I want Clinton. 
those people were people who previously worked in Clinton campaigns, previously worked for the DNC, essentially were Clinton representatives. So the Democratic Party was sued. Um, their lawyers turned around and said, look, we're a private organization. I don't care what our constitution says, we can do whatever we want. Try to sue us, we'll do it again. And they are doing it again. We see it now in the 2020 election. Um, I mean, it's crazy to watch. The television stations will be showing the 20 candidates that the Democrats currently have, and they'll just accidentally leave Bernie Sanders off the poll. It's, mm. it's, it's crazy and it's in your face, but it's in your face because they know that they can get away with it. Because the Democratic Party is not democratic, it's a private organization that gets to decide who the A of the A and B option is for the American people. Even if Bernie Sanders wins the presidential position as the Democrats, that doesn't mean that the Democrats in the House or the Senate will support Bernie Sanders. He can come along and say, okay, cool, I'm president now, we're doing a Green New Deal, and they can say, yeah, but we're not gonna vote through anything. And they will, and they have in the past. We saw this with Obama. We saw uh, Obama came into power with full support of the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party decided to not push forward any of the proposals that were voted for, and Obama decided to not push forward any of the proposals that he wanted, uh, or said he wanted. So the Democrats will not support Bernie Sanders if he does get into power. Now, that is undermined by the Our Revolution efforts. That is undermined by having people like AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashid Tlaib, in, in positions of power in the House and the Senate. Um, and we are seeing more and more success. We just had our 2018 elections for a lot of those positions. And I can say that quite a few socialists got through um, as Democrats. So that there is a ray of hope that those levers of power will include people who are committed to the Green New Deal should Bernie Sanders get through. But we don't know that and we can't guarantee that. And it's a complicated game. So to trust the Democrats full on is a hazy issue and for that you know there will be discussions of a third party you know should Sanders have launched a third party after the loss during 2016 is questionable was the right effort to create this caucus of people who are now getting involved in the levers of power to at least test this opportunity potentially that's good we don't know you know but going forward we have to be thinking about these things um, as mentioned you know the green the green party has been around for decades and you've never heard of them and that's part of the system um, so that's just my small synopsis analysis of the US. Um, I'm sure not everyone here is interested and, and should be interested in what's going on in the US. I'm happy to take that and, and make that the thing that I do with all my time. Um, but where can you find out more? If you are online, so is AOC. She's very online. Um, and she's really showing us how we should be expecting our elected representatives to behave online. Um, she treats her, AS, her Twitter very seriously. It's her Twitter. She tweets, her staffers don't tweet. Um, she considers her social media to be her voice and her way of connecting with people that she can't meet with face to face. And I think that's fantastic. Um, capitalism has not always existed in the world and will not always exist in the world <laughs> is one of her positions. So these people getting in are not pro-capitalist. They are socialist. The, the, the talking points inside America don't really allow for that, but they are still pushing for that. And you'll see how actively attacked she is over that, but still she's out there fighting. Someone I wanna, wanna mention that doesn't get a lot of mention in the world um, is Dr. Richard Wolf. If you're interested in actual analysis of the news in America from a socialist perspective, Dr. Richard Wolf is your man. Um, he runs the economic update through uh, democracyatwork.info. He's a Marxist economist who has a BA from Harvard, an MA from Stanford, an MA from Yale, and a PhD from Yale. He's a Marxist economist who is within the circles of power, definitely off on the side because he is a Marxist, but when things happen in the Federal Reserve, those things happened after you know he sat through lunches where he listened to those people talk about that. So he does provide an excellent weekly 30 minutes just rundown of what's happened in America and the world from a Marxist perspective. 15 minutes at the end of it is devoted to uh, meeting with someone who is involved in local life activities. So for 30 minutes a week, you can be getting a really good rundown of what's going on in America from an actual anti-capitalist perspective. Um, he also supports David Harvey, which I'm sure a few people here have heard that name and know who he is. Uh, he's now doing the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, as well as Readings of Marx uh, Capital, which is 
pretty fantastic because we need more and more of those <laughs> sort of bite-sized understandable chunks. Um, Global Capitalism Live Economic Update is another bi-monthly thing where he meets uh, at a, he goes to a church in New York City where he can get a big congregation of people around and does a, a two-monthly update of what's been going on. That goes for about two hours, that's also really good. Um, Capitalism Hits Home is uh, interviews that he does with a psychologist who does a lot of work on like how capitalism affects people at home, relationships, our life, how it really seeps into everything that we, we live through. Um, and he also uh, has Puerto Rico Goes Forward is a group of people that every month report on Puerto Rico, which is a, uh, a non-state member of the United States that doesn't get any sort of coverage at all, but is trying to fight for a socialist revolution. Uh, I also want to plug BreadTube slash LeftTube. Um, this is, uh, like full disclosure, this is a website that I work on, uh, but it is a way of collating media from across the world that is anti-capitalist. Um, breadtube.tv is the website. Now, it's just a website that lists and it's sort of out of date at this point, but what is there is the channels of people who are creating content. And there are some amazing people around the world who are really fighting for change through content. Um, and that's really it. If you want any more information, I too am way online. Um, I spend too much time caring about America, um, researching the US to Australia propaganda pipeline. Um, I'm willing to give myself brainworms using Twitter. Um, and I'm happy to field questions and uh, provide resources for anyone who's interested in what's going on in America. So that's my little analysis of a big country. Uh, pass it over. Oh. <laughs> Okay. No, no, I just like...